Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Gabriel Ritter. I am the director of the Art Design and Architecture Museum here at UC Santa Barbara. And we are very fortunate, well, first off, thank you all for coming, but we are very fortunate to have the artist Sandra Rodriguez here for the exhibition Unfolding Histories, 200 Years of Resistance. Um, we're also joined by Sarah Rosalena, who is CSB faculty here in the art department. Some of you may have uh, seen and uh, attended the fantastic talk last night at the MCA Santa Barbara. Last night's event and today's event are co-hosted and partnered by the two institutions. We also have ready with us uh, the amazing MCA. <laughs> at the MCA Santa Barbara. So if you have not seen Sarah's show, please check it out in, in uh, Paso Nuevo downtown. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Sandy, but before I do, I just want to let you know we are also uh, imminently going to release uh, the catalog for this exhibition. So if people are interested, you can either email, join the uh, newsletter, or literally just write your name down uh, and write your email contact over there, and we'll reach out to you. And once it's out, it'll be known far and wide, but you will be the first to know. So with that, Sandy, thank you for joining us. <laughs> pleasure to see you here today. I just want to thank um, the museum and Freddie for organizing uh, this dual program. Sarah gave me a call a couple months ago and said, why don't we do this? Why don't we do conversations at both of our exhibitions as we have so much to discuss and share with you all. So what I'm going to do is a 45 minute walkthrough focusing on the objects of the exhibition. Sarah and I are going to be riffing back and forth. <laughs> Feel free to interrupt and ask questions. This is a dialogue, not a lecture. Yeah? All right. So welcome. This is Unfolding History's 200 Years of Resistance. The centerpiece is this biombo, a double-sided maple folding screen that is based on really a colonial period biombo, which is a folding screen that's about half the size. That is several hundred years old. That is inspired by a Japanese folding screen that tells typically the story of the conquest from the uh, kind of dominant perspective. I've taken that format, commissioned uh, folks in Los Angeles to create this monumental folding screen which is about 200 pounds. And created a map on one side of the central coast telling of 200 years of resistance, all using hand processed earth mineral pigments from the region that I collected myself or that were gifted to me. All of this is hand mixed with oil on panel. Do you remember the winter? The rain that we had, <laughs> oil does not dry. Oh, yeah. In the winter. So this was in the works for about two years and it finished during that storm and nothing was drying. But what you're looking at are details that really kind of underscore revolution and resistance in a mapa of Central Califas. So, Going from the 2020 protests, public executions at the hands of police in San Luis Obispo, where families were tear gassed at the freeway entrance across from the police headquarters, is kind of the contemporary moment. Our annual wildfires that you see, and these are just the wildfires from 2022 in the Central Coast, those are kind of standing in as pronosticos or omens of these kinds of events. Later, you're going to find more details of medicinal plants, the image of one of the missions on fire from the Chumash Revolt as we approach the 200 year anniversary, and then elements from prior field study. So my practice is really rooted in material, rooted in research, rooted in history. And there are ways in which I experiment with the history of image making of the Americas and represent this content that is not so familiar to contemporary audiences to allow for us to understand how we arrived at this particular moment. 
And so I want to just kind of pause there and, and uh, ask Sarah if she's got any questions for the side of the Biombo. Yeah. And I, I would like to ask why the Biombo today in this contemporary moment, and why the structure is significant. So the Biombo, as I mentioned before, has been a kind of form that was used to describe the conquest. And if you take that form that was a diplomatic gift and you invert kind of that messaging to tell the story of resistance from this region, it is an opportunity to just really kind of drop uh, forms on their head and to really challenge and, and um, be in dialogue with the form. The form of the accordion also mimics the codices, which are the traditional books of the Americas that record history, genealogy, spirituality, that were all burned at the time of the Spanish conquest. And so this accordion fold structure is important for me to reintroduce to contemporary audiences as a form of the Americas. And I love that it's dual-sided. So there are multiple narratives happening simultaneously. And our talk yesterday was so much about the conversation of from stars to the land. So you know, this piece, I think, is the one I've seen a lot of your works represents the stars more fully, in particular the coastline. And I would love to hear your input on the dialogue between the two. Let's walk over to this side. And feel free to move around so you really get the play of the materials. Part of the research that I was able to do with the support of the museum over the past several years was to actually go out to Santa Cruz Island to Lima and do field study there, studying the botanical uh, kind of wealth of material there as well as the site. The intention was to look at Santa Barbara from the island, to understand what that view was from the initial kind of contact coming in on boats. What does Santa Barbara look like from the island? This is an extraordinary place that has such a rich history. And throughout my days that I was spending out there, I had the opportunity to go with the island director up to the tallest peak to observe the stars and do a ton of field study sketches and to look back at the land and to see that light pollution that you see on the horizon <laughs> here. <laughs> but to also really get into those lights on the coast and to reflect upon the generations of 12,000 years of the Chumash communities and imagine kind of that relationship back. Typically when I'm uh, working with nocturnes or nighttime scenes and the tradition of kind of uh, night scenes in American art. I'm using 23 karat gold and medieval uh, techniques to adhere to a mate. But in working on wood, it was really important for me to think about some of the materials that are specific to this region. I was really um, kind of uh, thoughtful about where and how to procure the abalone. So there is a jewelry maker who I've been working with and collecting her work for years. And she lives on the Saboba Res, and she makes these beautiful small um, earrings and necklaces. And I said, sometimes do you ever chip or break some of these small, tiny abalone? She's like, yes, I have a bag. <laughs> and so I was like, great. Can I just get your broken parts? And so you have to be very careful when you're working with abalone, but there's about 300 stars in here that were hand chipped. I've never carved into wood, and I bought a Dremel. <coughs> and I had some friends come over. And this took months and months and months of hand chipping abalone to insert those. The so names of the constellations, yeah. just a question. So you did this from sketches that you took at night? So I did a lot of uh, drawings at night, and then uh, one of the staff members at the reserve took some long exposure photographs okay, that I, I paired 
but yeah. I paired with it. Okay, great. So yeah, so it's that a combination of field study sketches, but also photography that helped inform the composition. Right, right. So not only did I use the abalone um, for some of these kinds of uh, constellations and views of the cosmos, but I also included the comet. The comet in the tradition of the Codices is an omen of the demise of populations. And so you find it in the Codex Duran, you find it in the Florentine Codex, you find it in a number of various texts. When researching um, some texts around the cosmology of the region, I found that there was a similar kind of understanding of. But all of this black that you see is from five months of my burning uh, oak and various hardwoods in the desert. So I come back from field study, I've got all this charcoal, and I grind it and I grind it, and it's the most beautiful, sparkly black you've ever seen. Mixed it with a binder, and then rolled it on the support. So that's why you get this like extra level of twinkle. What is but the binder? The binder is gum Arabic. Um, actually, for this binder, I ended up using um, a golden acrylic binder. Because it, it, it adheres real well, it, it yeah. looks good. It yeah. looks just like a matte black paint. Yeah, but if you move sideways, you'll see oh. the sparkles. Okay. That's what I was saying. Oh, well, that, I'll do that. <laughs> I see sparkle. <laughs> I see sparkle. <laughs> Starbucks. Yeah. And we're talking so much about how map making is so conceptual and that it's participatory. Um, requires a maker, but yet a reader. Um, and having this as a map also is very participatory. It's interactive. You have to walk around it. You have to engage with it to really understand the material. And would really like, curious to hear you more about your decision for doing this kind of like, almost like inversion with the land and the sky coastline, both being, um, you know, the geospatial edges of, you know, where we are at um, on unceded too, too much land, um, if you could mention. A little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it was really a, a remarkable opportunity doing an object as opposed to a flat work on paper. To think about the relationship to the viewer, to think about the relationship to space, to Santa Barbara, to the Central Coast, to think about, again, 12,000 years of cultural production and this unceded territory. I'm originally from the borderlands, from the U.S.-Mexico border in San Diego, but I've lived in Los Angeles since 87. I've spent a bit of time here, but I'm a visitor. And so there's a way in which, again, thinking about kind of that moment of contact that really was uh, this, this meeting of two worlds, this making of a new time period, this moment of collision, that was really important to me. And it afforded kind of this opportunity to look at it from two perspectives. One that's more familiar from your Google map, from your you know, uh, atlas, from your way of understanding land, but then this other way, and really thinking about the navigation of communities from island to island to the coast and thinking about some of those nighttime trips, and thinking about the ways in which celestial navigation is part of this kind of history of this area. And behind you, you have a number of the botanical specimens that I was able to observe and quietly draw in the morning after collecting and hiking. I had uh, three days, and Sophia beautifully organized and she's great. Beautifully organized this trip for us. And I got to go out with Jay Reddy and a dear colleague, Carmen Sandoval, who's a too much artist. And we spent three beautiful days uh, on the island, being driven around in this crazy old truck, going from part and part of the island. And I would just shout, stop. 
and stop to do a study of one of these plants. And with permission, collect a leaf, bring it back to the uh, compound, and then do a more careful study. So you can read the wall labels, but these are significant to um, the region. Uh, endemic, meaning they grow here and nowhere else in the world. This is one of the most stunning um, Santa Cruz Island ironwood. And you'll notice that when you look at the botanical specimens, you have the names that have been traditionally used to address these plants prior to the Latin binomial, prior to the English, prior to the Spanish. And while I referenced a number of publications, it was more important for me to consult with um, linguists who are Chumash, who are working on current dictionaries to get the 2023 vetted spelling of it. So understanding you know, the uses, the ethnobotany around this extraordinary um, ironwood was critical to the process. And it's about reclaiming knowledge that has been lost and or obscured over the past couple hundred years, but we knew so well in the past. And so this is a way of, again, taking those strategies. We've all seen botanical studies going back from the 16th century to present, from all kinds of colonial powers that are inventorying, cataloging the natural world. And so this is a way of creating a portrait that engages with language and that is kind of honoring these uh, vascular plants and entities that have contributed to the ecosystem in a really critical way. And many of these are um, endangered and if not um, threatened because of development in this region. And who knows if you know, in a few generations you may or may not have access to them. So it's important to create these as part of a larger series this whole exhibition is part of a larger series called the Codex Rodriguez Monterón. Sandy, could you just mention um, your, I know that you saw uh, many different plants and, and berries and whatnot, but as you did, certain, <laughs> but you selected certain ones uh, for a reason. Could you talk a little bit about um, some of the reasoning behind this? Sure, I mean, it's, it's about um, their, their aesthetic kind of qualities, because if you look at that iron one, the leaves are unlike anything you've seen. It is absolutely stunning. It's this palmate leaf with this very irregular but geometric pattern that I've never seen on another leaf in my life. Jen, have you seen a leaf like that? Only <laughs> Jen and I have done field study for the past seven years around 10 Western states really studying medicinal, uh, utilitarian, and extraordinary plants of the Western US. So it's like, oh my god, I saw the ironwood on the island. <laughs> um, and then manzanita. Like, we all love manzanita. And I don't know if any of you have ever enjoyed a manzanita cider. The berries, when you collect them late in the summer, you put them in some water. It's one of the most refreshing, delicious uh, beverages. But there are so many varieties. So it was about kind of my relationship to the plants, my, my kind of excitement about getting to meet them in different times of the year, um, and really focusing on the ones that are special to this region. Uh, this is Yerba Santa. And you have a couple varieties. But as I was up in one of the uh, peaks in Montecito, it was all over the road. And this is the, the more fuzzy variety. But this has been um, one of my kind of saviors over the past pandemic. It's for respiratory illness. It's for when your sinuses are clogged. When you get that scratchy throat and you're like, good God, do I have COVID? And then you're like, let me take some tea. And if it goes away, I'm fine. If it doesn't go away, test yourself. But Yerba Santa, like, I've gotten a handful here and there over the years. I keep it in a jar and I will make some tea when I get that kind of feeling, you know. But the, the ways in which I select the plants and decide to do the portraits, and in this case you'll see there's a monumental accordion book, 
And the paper is a sacred ceremonial outlaw paper. This is a mate. This is created by Efraim Danza in San Pablito in, uh, near Puebla, in Mexico. His grandfather taught him how to make the paper when he was 12. His grandfather was a shaman and a musician. Um, he's making more paper for me right now, so it's a custom sheet for this book that's almost eight feet long. And uh, I work with uh, Edwin Arceta, a Chicano paper a bookmaker in Los Angeles, to make my books for me. And he's working on a couple more. <laughs> but um, with Amate, because it is this sacred ceremonial paper, this bark is external bark from several trees that are local to the region. Traditionally, it's a fig bark. But those populations of trees have been uh, decimated in the region, so he's using conote and a variety of different fibers. The fibers are boiled in the water of um, the wastewater after processing maize. So it has some lye in it. After so processing what? The corn, maize. Oh, oh, maize. So um, then it's pounded with volcanic rocks and then laid in the sun on a wood smooth board. So it doesn't have sizing like European paper. When you paint on it, you get one shot. There's no erasing, there's no going over, you gotta start over. And with these books, it is, oh my god. Once the book is made, if you're gonna work on a paper, you can see one little area. Yeah. Where I was like, oh no, no. And I tried it, you can't erase, you cannot apologize, it is a done deal. But um, again, you know, really having uh, the names and having worked uh, with Matthew Bastito was really critical to getting the names uh, and the uh, agreed upon uh, kind of spelling. So this one's in Barbareño, this one's in uh, Ventureño. You'll see the initials and it's broken down in the label. One of the things that I really enjoy doing is thinking about um, pollinators. And who doesn't like a good little bat? <laughs> there were so many bats out on Santa Cruz Island and there were photographers and um, scientists that were working with the bat populations out there. And so, to have a little bat Pacific bat dude, that was like really a joy uh, when working on these. But you'll see a number of these um, plants depicted within the map. And I think that's really powerful discussing how plants render things visible. Because we're talking about things that have historically been unseen. This is a show about 200 years of resistance. So plants, you know, as resistance, uh, through material, I think it's such a powerful medium. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to hear more of how you incorporate plants in map making and cartography and their significance. So there's a way in which you can look at plants as indicators of specific regions. When you can understand kind of the relationship and the knowledge that has persisted over time. As I mentioned, these are edible, these are medicinal, these are spiritual in that they're used in ceremony. These are critical to this region. It is as important for me to understand these kind of endemic plants, the relationships to cultural production in the area, and also to think about their medicinal properties. We are living in a time period um, where a lot of this is lost on contemporary audiences. And when I can engage with them, there is a power of handling them. There is a power of spending time with them. There is a kind of multi-sensory experience. Some plants you have to ID when it doesn't have the fruit or flowers by a little scratch of the bark and sniffing by touching the uh, kind of glabrous or fuzzy part of the plant. There's a way of knowing and engaging with land and history that is very potent and very powerful when engaging with the plants. And the way in which you can identify uh, a region is through plants for me. And I love this, the, the fact that you mentioned even touching it, the paper, with some of the material. You can't reverse it, it's irreversible. And yeah. I thought that's also really significant, like the power of the plant, the power of the interaction um, is really 
it's that powerful. And I'll tell you, in um, the production of the series, I will do a color extraction from a small bit of the plant. Mm -hmm. Those colors are not stable, like the pigments that you see in this case. But once you create a dye by doing a heat extraction, by precipitating that dye with uh, alum and soda ash, to bond it to create a pigment, to then make it into watercolor, to then paint the picture, it might not be the actual color of the plant, but you're in, in, in kind of infusing the life force of that plant into the object. It has its kind of potency in its form, but also in its painted form. And to me, that is uh, one of the more soothing parts of telling of some of these more challenging stories in these moments that we're all witness to. Yeah. So the resonance is there, and, and you know the vibration, and it's so. And I, uh, I think that's a good segue for us to talk about you know pigment, like and the relationship between plant and pigment and historical significance. And um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So over here, and we've gotten a much. Larger groups, so just kind of rotate a little bit. We have a small sample of the pigments that I use, and go ahead and get closer. If you make the trip down to San Marino in Los Angeles, in, near Pasadena, there is a, an exhibition that's on view uh, called Borderlands, and you have a whole gallery of uh, one with a big map, several of a book, several of the botanicals, but then we have an entire room of my pigments. It's like my studio on steroids. <laughs> so in this case, what you're looking at, <laughs> mushroom. This is Phalea schwinzii, um, lovingly known as butt rot, <laughs> which makes me laugh. The 12-year-old in me loves saying butt rot. It's <laughs> part of my public programs. So I'm always looking for the indigenous name. And for this particular mushroom, I could not find it. Phalea schwinzii, yes. This was the name given in the 19th century, but what was it called before? And so I was unsuccessful after bothering people at various universities that had like database and this and that, and I couldn't find it, so I ended up using the Forestry Service nickname. But this yields a beautiful yellow that I use in my paintings, but then I'll reinforce it with a more stable kind of earth-based pigment. But this one, um, you basically have to do a number of steps of drawing it in a dehydrator. It goes like a cracker-like crisp. The spores are, are wet, they're yellow. And that is what gives you this bright acid yellow. Um, you can neutralize or acidify the color by adding um, modifiers like alum or other uh, copper or zinc. You can shift the color to be like four or five yellows. Mm -hmm. So it's not just one yellow. Mm -hmm. The next one, you might recognize some acorns. And you can boil those acorn uh, shells and then let it sit on the counter for a couple of days. And it makes a beautiful brown. There's my charcoal from the fire, and that is hardwood. Then you have a yellow ochre, which actually comes from the San Inez Valley, and a dear colleague, uh, Devlin Gandhi, and collected that for me and sent it to me. But it is the color of the region. That yellow was ground along with this uh, red over that he also got for me um, in the Cespi. Those two were ground together to make that beautiful warm tone on the wood. So the land is painted in the land. Mm -hmm. This is the iron of this region, right? This is the color of the earliest painted sites in the region. This is what you're going to find in every uh, painting that you're going to find um, that was done on a rock support in the cave. Cochinilla, this red, this red that Sarah and I love, um, is an insect. It's a scale insect that feeds on the flesh of cactus. This red transformed global art markets from the 16th to 18th century. No one in Europe had this red. This red was exported. This red has been cultivated for 10,000 years. This red can be changed from purple to red to orange, depending upon acids or iron that you add to it. 
there is a green antlerite, a blue azurite, a Maya blue, which is an indigo that is uh, heated with a polygorskite clay that goes back to the third century. The opacity of the mineral pigments are referencing underworld deities. The translucence of the organic colorants are referencing the celestial realm and the solar realm. So there are codified ways in which I play with color. And there are codified ways in which Sarah plays with color. No, and it's really interesting, again, this concept of render. Um, making things invisible visible. But here, this is where land, this is where kin, this is where the resistance is. And I think it's really interesting to incorporate this in, for example, structures of power. Um, how do you override these narratives? Um, because at the same time, you can have these works and they can be presented in that way, but what's really there is ancestors, is kin, is land. Um, and I'm just really curious, you know, like how you're using material as a narrative. Would you, you've been doing so eloquently, but um, maybe for people to know a little bit more about how you're using this in one of the larger works. So I'll tell you, I'm a three generations painter. Grandpa, grandma, mom, all trained in the European tradition, all Mexican painters. I worked with European materials up until 2017. I worked in museums. I did a lot of research and teaching on the methods and materials of painting in the European tradition. It wasn't until I was able to take that shift from working in museum education full time and painting on evenings and weekends to flip that, that I was able to do a deep dive and study the history of color and image making in the Americas. There is a resistance and a deep investment in presenting and understanding the ideas and the material. There is a communion of me working with these materials in reciting a colonial text when I'm working with the materials that allow me to connect with the painters that came before my grandfather, that allow me to let the material work with me to create the image. There is a way in which the actual material, just like the subject of the plants, provides a, a, an opportunity for healing the traumas that we are witnessing today and the traumas that have been part of the culture of this region for the past couple hundred years. And there is such an extraordinary feeling, just like I talked about when you're scratching or holding or feeling a plant when you're processing these colors. Because you have to grind these colors in the mortar. You have to wash these colors, let them dry in the sun, mix them with a binder, paint them with a specific brush. But each has a very distinct feeling. And there is a bit of ritual and ceremony that goes with the actual production of working with these materials and changing the experience of the viewer from modern colors that we're just so used to these high keyed, saturated, qigong colors, they're like whiny colors, and really kind of taking it back to colors from the region. Yeah, no, and that's a great way to, you know, how color is political. And like the cochinilla is the perfect example of um, how it was extracted and used in, you know, royalty. Um, but it is, it's, it's a color of the Americas, and I think you know, I think that might be an interesting segue to, you know, talk further about resistance and um, the works on this side. Yeah. Um, talk about healing. Yeah. yeah. And I'll tell you, um, last April, I had a chance to work with a Sapotec artist here in the Central Coast of Ventura, Orfirio Gutierrez, who is an extraordinary artist in Czech studios over at the Bell Arts Towers or Bell Factory. Arts Community Factory. Factory. We were talking about cochinilla, this, this red, this nochestli. Um, not only does it have the history that we talked about, but you can see it kind of clotted here in its more kind of raw pigment form. So cochinilla, or in Zapotec bebia, is used for the treatment of a 
anxiety and trauma. So after you use it and process it for its medicinal use, you can then dye with it textiles, or you can precipitate it into a watercolor paint. I chose to use the cochinilla here as part of these wildfires that rage in California. There is an opportunity for me to think about these annual wildfires as ongoing colonial aggression. It is through the mismanagement of this land, through this European kind of imposition, that we are in this particular moment. It's about climate change. It's about mismanagement. It's about this aggression that has transpired that now threatens communities consistently more and more each year. You have these wildfires, but then you also have fires of protest. This map was created in 2020, 2021, and part of a, a solo show that I had at the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. It's called Mapa de Califas, Atrocities, Isolation, and Uprising. There is a key to this map, like colonial biombos have, that go with the numbered elements on it. So you'll find protesters that are protesting one of the first migrants to die in ICE custody in the pandemic. That's number one. Number two is, in the first quarter of the pandemic, officers in ICE facilities were gassing migrants with HPQ causing all kinds of respiratory illness and permanent damage. An LAPD cruiser on fire that you saw in Los Angeles in the news. The Oakland protests where families and community members are gassed with tear gas that you see in SLO. A hunger strike for COVID protections. They weren't even allowed soap, let alone masks at the start in these facilities. So there is a way in which we will not forget. It's through visually documenting, presenting these atrocities that you're going to forget about as soon as you keep scrolling on your phone. But there's a way in talking about resistance and the way in which responsible members of our communities will rise up and declare that we're not going to take this anymore. And so this is this opportunity to really think about resistance and the ways in which we can keep these conversations in the front of our minds and understand that it is an ongoing battle, it is an ongoing resistance, and it is through opportunities like this we can talk and really uh, tie it all together with kind of our lived experience and then we, of course, always have the Calavera helicopters. We have more helicopters in Southern California than most industrialized nations. And it's that panoptic eye that is forever over our heads. Yeah, it's really interesting for you to um, discuss more of all this work being from that aerial view, violence from the aerial, um, the all-seeing eye, and how that's been mapped, and how we, that is how we are generated with knowledge production, and, you know, we think about, you know, even how we get here, GPS, we have, now we have satellites <laughs> tracking our every move, and every, every time I download an app, it's like, do I allow this app to track me? Yeah. You know, we're constantly in this negotiation of being surveilled from above, and um, I'm really curious your thoughts on, like, also the aerial view, um, why now? So every map, and if you go onto my website, you'll see that there are now 12 maps that have been produced over the past seven years. Every map is different. There's a way in which uh, European mapping from the early modern period to contemporary Google Maps and Google Earth and satellite maps to um, indigenous cartography. There's a way of experiencing place, and I'm constantly playing with creating hybrids of those. I will, if, as you see this one, I will go into Google Earth and Google Maps and I'll take a contemporary view, but then I will in certain elevation uh, as, a, as a detail. There's a way in which you play with this reference to kind of this constant surveillance and this positionality of the viewer and of the time that we're living in. But it's certainly a device that I do not tire of exploring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think with all of these, you know, your back 
graphs that are so monumental, it, it takes time to kind of delve into each vignette. And yeah. so, you know, especially like when, of course, with the Abate paper, you're, you're going right into it. Yeah. Um, so I also wonder if you can speak a little bit about um, some of the creatures, animals mm -hmm. uh, that we see. Oh, you noticed them? <laughs> well, they, they, again, took time for me to get to there, but yes. yes. <laughs> I like to make jokes. And I like to reference a number of sources. And so I have a little self-portrait in here. Mm -hmm. A little closer you can see. Mm -hmm. It's myself as an anglerfish. <laughs> <laughs> There's always going to be a little bit yeah, that's of a good idea. fun, right? You got it. So we don't have a lot of anglerfish off the Pacific coast. But there was one that washed on shore in San Diego County. I love anglerfish. They are the most bizarre <laughs> deep sea creatures. You can look them up. There's so many videos I won't distract and get into that. But I am all about the natural history from a variety of time periods. But this little anglerfish with their stinky little gas headlamp um, is under there and it's about to attack a customs border enforcement Great. boat that captured migrants that capsized off the coast of San Diego. So this is from the news headlines. These other ones, the Papalomici, are from a 16th century book of natural history. It has a flying fish that carries the souls of the warriors who died in battle. So there's a way in which I'm collapsing time and space through my references of pelicans that are the liaisons between the celestial realm the celestial realm and the watery realm. Um, Camarón que se duerme se lo lleva la corriente is a saying that's, if you snooze, you're going to get carried away by the tide. So stay alert. Keep your eyes open. There's a lot of refrains, um, bichos, elements that kind of play in and out of my works. And again, there's that kind of playfulness with the actual fibers. So you'll see like, little fish coming in and out between the fibers. But you'll also find these direct references. And if you Google any of those five, six uh, headlines, those are linked to news stories. I'm not making any of this up. This is all based on research. Join me in thanking Sandy.